So just a reminder, in a traditional home loan, the bank loans you $200,000 to buy the house. You'd agree to pay 1000 a month for 30 years. So you're going to pay $360,000 back on the $200,000 home you just bought. Okay? Bank makes money. You get the house. All is well. Except that's kind of tiresome for the bank. Right? Banks, um, there's an old joke in the old days in banks that banking is uh, 363. That you get money at 3%, you loan out money at 6%, and you're on the golf course by 3 o'clock. Well, banking isn't boring like that anymore. Banking is a complex, um, fast-moving enterprise in the modern world. Okay? So banks don't want to give you that $200,000 and just sit there for 30 years and wait for you to pay it back. So we create a CDO. We do something called securitization. So the blue line, let's start on the right-hand side. I take out a loan for $200,000, and I agree. I give the bank a piece of paper that says I owe you $1,000 a month for 30 years. The bank then goes to someone in China and says, loan me $200,000, and I will pay you $800 a month. Okay, 4%. That's 4%, right? 800 a month is 4%. So I'm paying 6% on my house or whatever percent on my house. You're paying 4%, right? There's a difference there. The bank, what's going to happen? The bank had $200,000 and no income. The bank loans out $200,000 to me. Incomes, $1,000 a month. The bank borrows back the $200,000 from somebody else and pays out $800 a month. So now the bank has the 200,000 back just like it started, but it's got 200 a month coming in every month. So the bank went from having $200,000 and no income to $200,000 and $200 a month coming in. And now it's going to loan out that $200,000. Okay? So we keep doing this. We loan out 200,000 for 1,000 coming in. We borrow 200,000 for 800 coming in. We've got a loan and a borrow and a loan and a borrow and 1,000 and 800 and 1,000 and 800 and 1,000 and... You with me? And by the time I've done this four times, the bank owes $800,000. It owes $800,000 to other people. It's owed $800,000 by its customers. It's collecting four thousand a month. It's paying out thirty-two hundred dollars a month. It's getting eight hundred a month, and it's got its two hundred thousand dollars back. And it can keep doing this over and over and over again. Okay, but you can see that it's a house of cards, because if the people on the right stop paying their thousand dollars a month, now we got a big problem. Okay. So you got more and more investors who want more and more bonds. So what do we need to create those bonds? We need mortgages. The bonds over here, over here, these things are bonds. Okay, mortgage-backed securities. These are bonds. The bonds are built on these mortgages over here. So to build more bonds, we need more mortgages. But all the people who can afford a mortgage really have one, and we're going to have to start getting creative. And so companies like Countrywide start doing um, certainly not ethical, but also probably illegal things to get more mortgages created. So we create these mortgages that basically were bad going in, right? People took out mortgages on what they couldn't afford, except what instead of paying agreeing to pay $1,000 a month for 30 years, you agree to pay $200 a month for three years and $5,000 a month after that. Why would you do that? Well, you're not going to planning on keeping the house for three years. Price, house prices were going up 20 or 30% a year in Las Vegas. You figured if you kept the house for two years, you bought a million dollar home. You kept that home for two years. At the end of that two years, it's worth a million and a half. You sell it. You turn after tax, right? You get a million, a half a million dollars profit off of that. You don't have to pay that many taxes on that because it's a house. You got a half a million dollars you walked away with. Now you can go buy a house. Okay? 
But what happens if that million dollar house two years down the road is only worth 400000 and you can't sell it because you couldn't pay off your loan by selling it and now you're stuck with it. You can't make the new mortgage payment when it comes. You're going into foreclosure and bankruptcy. The bank is in financial trouble. The, the, yeah, okay. That's what's going to happen. Okay. Making this more complicated is that we have what's called the shadow banking system. So there are companies out there that can act like banks, things like hedge funds and mutual funds that take deposits and make loans, but they're not regulated like banks. So there's banking activity that goes on. Those banking activities in, the, in these shadow banks don't have to follow the rules. So they're in a financial crisis. They're more likely to get into trouble and into bigger trouble than the banks are, and they can drag the banks down with them fun yeah so again that's just a quick quick thing and we'll talk about more parts of this um, over the next couple chapters all right the last thing and this there's a lot of stuff stuffed in this chapter it's like there's a lot of stuff stuffed in this chapter the quantity theory of money this is a really old theory. The ancient Greeks knew it. We know from the writings of ancient Greek philosophers that they got this. So it's thousands of years old. This theory's been around in various forms. Okay. How do we have $20 trillion GDP if we only have $5 trillion in money? Let me say that again. If we only have $5 trillion that we can spend, how do we spend $20 trillion? Hmm. Good trick. Well, the answer's pretty simple. When you go to Subway and you give them $5 for your sandwich, do they hold on to that $5 for a year? Or do they go give that $5 to somebody else and they can go? Yeah. So money doesn't sit around. It's not idle. Money goes from one person to another person. to right. It goes from a person to a business to a person to a business to a person. Okay? Money moves around. That movement of that money from place to place is generically called the velocity of money. You like that? Velocity Technically, the velocity is the average number of times each dollar is used in a year. The average number of times. So, just without doing the details, we'll do the details here in a second. But if we got twenty trillion in spending with five trillion in money, we must have used every bit of money four times, right? Four times five equals twenty. Yeah. So our velocity must be about four. So V equals GDP divided by M. So I take the GDP, I divide by the how much money we have, which is really 21,534 divided by 5, right, is 4.22. So the velocity of money, the M1 velocity of money is 4.22. Is that exciting? Okay, you're going, why do I care? Well, look at that thing I just wrote. V equals GDP divided by M, right? We took the 20, divided it. We can do algebra on that. I know that's exciting to you. And we can show that GDP equals M times V. Do we get that? So if I take the amount, of, if I know, if somebody tells you velocity is 4.22, and you know the amount of money is 5098, you can figure out what GDP is, right? So if you don't know the velocity, but you can take GDP and the money supply to find velocity. But if you know the velocity, you can take the money supply and velocity and find GDP. Okay, we good? All right. We can also calculate GDP by multiplying the quantity of things we buy times the price, right? That's the official way we calculate GDP. We go, hey, we sold all these cars. This is the price of those cars. <coughs> That's how much money we have. That's what GDP is, right? We sold these cars. We produced these cars at this price. That's GDP, which means that GDP is price times quantity is PQ, where P is the price level and Q is real GDP. In your brain, you should be going, that graph, that aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph we just did, that's P and G, G, yeah, yeah, exactly. This GDP equals price times quantity, PQ, price level in real GDP. This is the, the aggregate demand thing that we just did a chapter ago. Okay? Everything's connected in the great circle of life. All right. So the quantity theory of money, we just knew, we just learned something. Visualize in your mind. 
GDP equals M times V, and GDP equals P times Q, which means M times V is also equal to P times Q. We call this the equation equation of exchange equation of exchange. All right. Now I use Q. Your book uses Y, and why I didn't change this to Q is just didn't feel like it. Okay. So MV equals PY in your book. MV equals PQ in my world. In the next chapters, I'm sure I'll switch back to Y just because. But I don't like Y. Don't ask me why. M times V equals P times Q equals GDP. That's the equation of exchange. Okay? This is the quantity theory of money. So M is for money. V is velocity. P is the price level. Q is real GDP. Okay? M is the money supply. V is velocity. P is price level. Q is real GDP. Or Y is real GDP. Ready? It's exciting. Now you're like, oh, why are you doing this to us? Wait. It gets exciting. All right, so let's take our equation here and just assume V is constant. V doesn't change. V is fixed. And assume that over time, Q just goes up slow. What's that mean about M and P? If V doesn't change and Q is just going up slowly or basically doesn't change either, then whatever happens to M has also got to happen to P. Let me say that again. With V constant and Q just basically going up slowly, whatever happens to M is also going to happen to P. If we see what the money supply is doing, we should know what prices are doing. Oh my goodness. This theory says... The money supply is what makes prices move. So if the money supply goes up, the price level will go up. If the money supply goes down, the price level will go down. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's exciting. M and P are tied together. The money supply and the price level are tied together in this theory. Okay. Which has its assumptions. And we'll talk about that. So this theory says that changes in the money supply cause changes in the price level. Now, obviously, you're probably already going, you know, how about, how about, how about, yeah, there's a million how abouts about this thing, and yeah, we'll be back. Talk about this a lot over the next few chapters. Okay, so this dude here is a guy named Milton Friedman. I only met him a couple times. Was, I didn't like him. I didn't think he was a very nice human being, but many people revere Milton Friedman as like a guru of gurus. Milton Friedman said that MV equals PQ would one day be thought of like E equals MC squared, that it would be an uh, equation that would define um, economics and it's a universal equation that, you know, is a, like a f principle of basic physics. I don't think so, but Uncle Milty said it. Other people certainly believe it. Um, I had, when I was in grad school, one of the other grad students was just an absolute Friedman fanatic. And when you would ask him a question about Milton Friedman's view of the quantity theory of money that he didn't have an answer for, he'd look at you and he'd say, either you believe in God or you don't. So people get very excited about this stuff. So... Milton Friedman allows, there's stuff about V, it's more complicated, but basically, you know, he's, V doesn't play a role in this, V is constant. And he says, look, I agree, if there's too much money in the system, you're going to get inflation. And the way to stop inflation is to keep money supply from going up. That's Adam Smith, right? Adam Smith believed that same thing. So this is nothing new and exciting. But then, then he's going to add something to this. He's going to say, what if in your economic system you don't have a really competitive economic system and when there's uh, prices just don't go down? 
right? Prices only go down slowly. Prices are sticky. He doesn't use the word sticky, but you can see this sticky prices idea that's going to really play into economics, and it's kind of it's coming out of Uncle Milty here. He says, what happens if prices just don't go down that much? What if P only goes up? Well, if V is fixed and P can't go down, if M goes down, what has to go down? Let's see here. So M goes down. V's fixed, can't go down. P's fixed, can't go down. Uh-oh, Q's got to go down. That's a recession. So now we have, in Friedman's model of the world, an explanation for recessions. If the money supply goes down, and P can't go down enough, Q's got to go down, and that's how we get a recession. He blamed the entire Great Depression basically on the Federal Reserve and its um, letting the money supply contract and all this other stuff. Okay, and again, these are these are things we still argue about, and he's been dead a while, and we still argue about all this stuff. And again, um, I don't like him anyhow. He did say inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That's a widely quoted phrase of Milton Friedman. Comes out of this quantity theory of money that says prices are tied to the amount of money. Okay. Now let me just say, and we'll talk about this more as we get into other things. But V is not constant. If M's not constant, and V's not constant, and P's not constant, and Q's not constant, this is one equation with four unknowns, and it doesn't mean anything other than it's an accounting identity. Okay? So you can take this equation as it means absolutely nothing except that at the end of the year, we stick the numbers in there and they balance. Or you could take this equation as defining economic activity or anywhere in between. And you can make an argument that that's the way the world is. Okay? Milton Friedman. And now, finally, it's time for us to move on. Yes?